room, I want to challenge you today to lean in. This is going to be a message that I believe is so important for your heart and your soul. This is not going to be a message that just tickles your ears and makes you smile and covers the surface level issues in your life. This will be a message that digs deep. How many of y'all want to dig deep today? All right. So today we're going to go deep because the story that we've been in, we've been in a series called David. And we've been talking about how David had uh, really a whole lot of success in his life, but he also walked through a lot of difficulties. And David was one of, known as one of the best kings of Israel, uh, and that out of David's family came Jesus. So there's so many lessons to learn, but this one moment in David's life was a moment of really a family feud. There was a civil war happening in the nation of Israel, uh, and it wasn't against one group against another group. It wasn't against one political party against another political party. It was between a father and a son. It was between David and his little boy, Absalom. And what had happened between David and his son, this father and the son, is there had been a wedge, a, a really just a moment of unforgiveness. And over time, it kept growing and it kept building and John Eldridge wrote a book that I remember reading in college called Wild at Heart. And in this book, he talks about the father wound, the wound that every girl and every boy has that has ever felt rejection or disapproval or abandonment from a dad. And because of that wound, there's so many issues that arise as we get older. And people might look at someone's addiction, whether it's a gambling addiction, a, a drug addiction, a, a, an immoral addiction, or something like that. And they would say, well, they just like sin. They just like that thing. But deep beneath those addictions and those problems, and if you were to go into most of the prisons across our nation, there is a factor in most of the reasons why people get into trouble and violence and sin and addictions and keep going back to places they shouldn't go and, and doing things they shouldn't do. And the common denominator is most of those people grow up with a father wound that they never know how to find healing in. They never know how to find forgiveness in. And even in the best homes, you know, I'm thankful to grow up with a good dad, but even in the best homes, there are room. There is room in every person's heart for wounds to build and to grow. And so we see in this story, a, a boy named Absalom takes his dad to war, and he turns the whole nation of Israel against his father, who was the king of Israel. And it says in verse 6 that the people went out into the field of battle. Everybody say battle. There is a battle going on for your soul. There's a battle going on for our nation. There's a battle going on for the masculinity in our culture. The enemy wants to turn men into women and women into men. The enemy is trying to confuse men to not know who they are or not know how to function. There is a battle for masculinity. There's a battle. And I'm all for women rising up and being wonder women and superheroes. But what's happened is this, the enemy is trying to emasculate men. The enemy is trying to pull men out of the picture and fathers out of the homes and sons against their dads. And what we see here is a, a civil war happening between a dad and his son. The battle was in the woods of Ephraim. And it says that day that the people of Israel were overthrown before the servants of David. A great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. And one day, without guns and bombs and missiles, just swords and bows and arrows, 20,000 men died. And you might think, well, man, that, that's crazy. But look at the next verse. It says that that day the battle was scattered over the face of the whole countryside and the woods, everybody say the woods, devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. The woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Now, these weren't some crazy kind of woods like out of Lord of the Rings where the woods come to life and they, you know, pick up and they move places. These were regular trees. These were like the trees you see in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But these trees devoured more men that day than the sword. Can you imagine with me just for a moment? Close your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me. 20,000 corpses strung out across the fields of Israel, but over on the side of the fields are these woods, this forest. And if you were to go into the forest in your mind, if you could just walk through it, you would see bodies strung over branches and bodies laying over roots and stumps. And you would ask yourself, where's the sword wounds? What happened here? I don't see any arrows piercing their heart. How did they die 
in the woods. And I, I remember reading the scripture and wondering to myself, what, what is God trying to speak here that the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured? And I'll tell you what's happening in our world. The enemy is trying to pull men off the battlefield of faith and into the woods of discouragement, into the woods of bitterness, into the woods of secret sin. The woods represent anything that is not God's plan for your life. That we have a battlefield that God has called us to walk in, and we have everything it takes to win that battle. We have guaranteed victory through Jesus Christ. We have the armor we need to fight the good fight of faith. We got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes that are shod with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith that blocks every fiery dart from the enemy, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, our offensive weapon. We have what it takes to stay on the battlefield. But why are men running from their posts? Why are men leaving the battlefield and wandering into the woods? It's like we're taking our helmet off. We're laying down our shield. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. I mean, I've got two little boys, a two-year-old and a three-year-old, and they keep me up all night and wake me up early in the morning and diapers being changed and trying to do work and trying to take care of the, the things in the church and trying to be there for as many people that need me to be there. Paul, I need you here. Paul, I need you there. Pastor, I need more time with you. Pastor, come and visit my family. And I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And listen, <laughs> the struggle is real. The enemy knows that men are being pulled on. And so what he does is he takes the pressure and the weight that's on the man, that's on the father, that's on the mantle. Because listen, God has called men to be leaders in their house. So the enemy takes the pressure, the weight that's sitting on the man and says, why don't you, why don't you come over here? Take your ring off. Why don't you get into these woods? Why don't you go over here? Just take your helmet off. And what's happening across our world is men are wandering into the woods. And they're going into places they have no business going into. And, and the struggle is real, the exhaustion. It's not that they just love sin, it's that they're tired on the battlefield. And Absalom wanders into the woods and, and that day 20,000 men died. And look at verse nine here. It says that Absalom was riding on a mule and the mule went under the thick bows of a great terebinth tree. So here, Absalom, the leader of the men who went into the woods, and there's people always following you. Don't ever think that your sin doesn't affect your family. People think, well, I can do this and there will be no consequences for everybody else. But people follow you into the woods. And what you think you can handle, just one drink, he sees you taking that drink and he goes and takes 10 more drinks. I can handle this. Yeah, but the people that are following you go further than you went in. And Absalom finds himself in the trees. And look at this, his head is caught in the terebin. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth and the mule which was under him went on. So here Absalom is hanging in the trees. He can't get his head out of the branches, his eyes, his ears. Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. For the father up above is looking down in love. I forget the rest of the song. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the point. Absalom got his head caught in the trees. The devil is in no hurry to pierce your heart if he's got a hold of your head. The devil's in no hurry to take out your family if he's got the leader's head wrapped up, his eyes wrapped up, his ears wrapped up, his mind wrapped up. Absalom's just hanging there. And today I want to share with you a couple things that I think are important. Because if we were to back up, what led Absalom to this place? It started years before this. In fact, it was almost 10 years prior. Everything was going good in the family of David. Until one day, one of his children did something terrible to one of his other children. And it caused a rift in the family because David, as the dad, didn't know what to do. And oftentimes we put dads on pedestals as if they're always supposed to do everything right and perfect. But there are no perfect fathers on earth. There is only one perfect father up above. And in him, we find hope and healing and identity and forgiveness for when we miss it here on earth and grace. 
But what happened was, was David missed it. And because he missed it, Absalom grew bitter and angry. Why didn't dad step in? Why didn't dad correct him? Why didn't dad rebuke him? Why didn't dad discipline him? What was dad thinking? And he grew this bitterness towards his dad to the point where internally he was saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And, and there was this anger and this silent treatment that was happening between father and son. And no words were exchanged. And over time, Absalom killed one of David's kids because of the situation. Then Absalom fled and he lived far away from family. And after a few years, the father, David, called him back home. In 2 Samuel 14, 21, it says, bring my son Absalom back here. But it says then in verse 24, do not let him see my face. He can live in our house, but he cannot see my face. So we have a father and a son living in the same neighborhood and not talking to each other. Awkward. Not even looking at each other. There's this soap opera playing out and all of Israel is watching it. What's going on between the father and the son? And then it says in verse 25, by the way, Absalom was very handsome. He was so good looking from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. There was no blemish in him. So good looking. This guy was like Fabio, like Justin Bieber. He was like Zoolander. Everybody looked at this guy as the male model of Israel and everybody admired Absalom. He's so hot. And uh, verse, look at, look at this, verse 26, every year he had a haircut, and his haircut was like a national event. Everybody showed up for Absalom's haircut. <laughs> they, would, they would cut his hair, man, he would let his hair just blow in the wind, and then they would cut it, and then they would weigh the hair, and this guy was ridiculous. <laughs> but no matter how good he looked, and no matter how hard he tried to win his dad's approval, to get his dad's validation, look in verse 28, it says, but still, he dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but never saw the king's face. 24 million children in America right now are growing up without a father figure in their life. 24 million children. Between first grade and 12th grade, 43% of kids do not have a father figure. Someone that just believes in them. Someone that says, I love you. Someone who gives them a little bit of validation, a little bit of affirmation. And what we see in this story is that Absalom was craving a father in his life. And all of us in this room, even in the best homes, have experienced those wounds of when dad didn't show up. Dad didn't say good job. He was silent, and silence speaks. And when you were hoping he was going to say, I'm proud of you, he said, I'm disappointed in you. And when you were hoping he was gonna hug you, he walked away. And those little wounds over time, if we don't know who to take them to and where to open up, and we close up, and all we want is sugar-coated, ear-tickling sermons every week, we miss out on the healing that Papa God wants to bring in our hearts so that we can be the kind of dads and men of God and women of God that we're called to be. I know this isn't easy. This is not easy for me to preach because I read this story and I go, I don't wanna talk about that on Father's Day. But it's like I can hear Father God showing, if, he's saying, if you don't, there's going to be people that carry wounds that never let Papa God bring healing in. I remember reading this book about fathers, and, and they were telling the story about this boy who he couldn't go to church, because at church they kept calling God Father. And the father he knew was abusive. The father he knew would pull out wrenches and screwdrivers and hit him on the back and the head. He had wounds on his sides, and so when he heard Father, he said, no, no, no. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not going to that place. I know what a father's like, and I don't need another one. And because of the pain of growing up in that house, he never knew what Papa God, what Father God was like. When we look in the scriptures, we don't see an abusive God. We don't see a mean God, a mad God, a passive aggressive God, a bipolar God, a God who's happy one day and mad the next day. We see a constant, faithful, good, merciful, definition of love kind of God. A God who holds no records of wrongs. A God who wants to heal your heart. Absalom never made it out of the woods. Everybody say, stay out of the woods. Because once you go into the woods, it's hard to get out. Once you get into the stuff that the enemy wants to get you into, Absalom, he grew bitter towards his dad. He never forgave his father. He never forgave him. That bitterness led him into the woods. I want the keys to come out because there's, there's some things I want to close with that I think are really important. What happened was Absalom was driven because of his bitterness and his wound from his dad 
to take his dad to war. Absalom grew a rebellion. He grew a lot of people around him. He dishonored his dad. He said, if I was king, I would do things differently than my dad. If I was in charge, things would be different around here. Be careful when people start saying, if I was in charge. Be careful hanging around people who say, if I was the leader here, if I was in charge here, if it was me, if I was making the decisions, I would do it differently than him. God never honors dishonor. God never blesses a spirit of rebellion. Whether or not your leader is a Saul or a David or an Absalom, stay in that place of trusting in God. And so what happened was Absalom grew this rebellion. We hate it around here. We hate our dads. And it was like a group of all rebellious kids. They were so angry at their dads. They didn't let God heal the father wound. And they thought, we're going to take them to war. Sons versus fathers. So David is running with a group of older men. And they're running into, away from Israel. They're running into the wilderness. Because they've been in the wilderness before. They knew what the caves were like. And Absalom goes chasing him with all the sons, all the angry boys mad at their dads. You know, Hollywood has tried to make movies about the father wound, about how to heal the, the situation between dads and daughters and dads and sons. You've got cartoons about it. You've got Finding Nemo and you've got Blood Diamond and The Judge and you've got Peter Pan and The Lost Boys and you've got all kinds of movies trying to figure out that wound between fathers and their children. But Hollywood can't heal your heart. And you say, well, Paul, I feel like the wounds that have happened between me and my dad, you know, we don't talk about it. I don't think we should. Time will heal all wounds. Baloney. Time won't heal what you won't face. Time won't heal what you won't bring to God and uncover. There's a story, true story, in Alaska, when Eskimos are wanting to kill a wolf, and wolf is good meat for the Eskimos, they love it, but it's a tough thing to kill a wolf. So what they do is they take a knife and they go near the water and they, they kill a seal, because there's thousands of seals just sitting there, and they'll take the dagger and rub the blood of the seal all over the knife, then they'll stick it in the snow, and the wind blows and the snow comes and it forms a blood popsicle around that blade. And the wolves have incredible scent. They can smell from miles away. <sighs> Free meal. Free seal. <sighs> ah, we don't even have to work for it. I can smell the blood. It's been a while since I've tasted that. Some of us in this room, the woods are calling your name. You've been tired on the battlefield. You've been offended. You've been hurt. You've been let down by people who were supposed to be there for you but they rejected you, they betrayed you, they hurt you. There's children in the room today that you, you're angry at your dad. There's parents in the room today and, and there's this anger, there's this bitterness and, and, and generational curses are just, just this passing down of hatred, this passing down of rejection, this passing down of disapproval. And, and just like the Eskimos, what they do is they know the wolves will come to the blood. So the Eskimos hide out and they watch and they wait and the wolves are locked in on the scent of the blood. They don't even smell the Eskimos. So they get to that blade and they start licking it. <sighs> you guys don't wanna see me doing that, so. And the wolves start licking it and their tongue cuts through the ice and starts to lick the blade. <sighs> and it starts to slice their tongue and shred it to pieces and they start bleeding. And the wolves finally fall over and they die. They self-destruct. The Eskimos walk up, and there's their meal. They didn't even have to take the wolf out. The devil is in no hurry to take you out when he's got a hold of your eyes and your ears and your heart and your bitter. See, the woods start in the heart. Before you ever get into that addiction, before you ever commit that sin, it begins in the mind. The battle is between the ears. This is where the battle takes place, entertaining those thoughts searching for significance, men looking for approval, looking for that validation, that affirmation, and then wandering into the woods off the battlefield. The enemy has a target on every man in this room. 
He wants to take the seed out of the world. He wants to shut down masculinity. He wants to shut down leaders. He wants to pull out fathers. If he can take out the father, he can take out the house, but not in this house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will be a church of mighty men, mighty, mighty men, fathers of faith, fathers of compassion, fathers with a soft heart and thick skin. It takes a man to go down to an altar call. It takes a man to get down on his knees and pray. It takes a man to hug his child. It takes a man to say, I love you. See, our world has tried to confuse men. You gotta be cold, you gotta be tough. Don't say anything. That was one of David's biggest regrets. I never told him what I should have told him. And the good news is that God didn't end with David being a dad in this way. David really longed for that relationship with Absalom to be restored and it never got restored and Absalom never made it out of the woods. And David wept and he mourned, I, I missed it as a dad. And you want the best outcome for your kids. You want your kids to make all the right choices, but you can't drag your kids to the cross. You can't force your kids to make every perfect decision. You gotta do your best and trust God for the rest. You gotta walk in love, you gotta walk in forgiveness, and you gotta realize everyone in this room, give each other a break, give each other grace. We put each other on these high expectation pedestals, like you can't miss it, you can't disappoint me but we're human and fathers aren't perfect on the earth. And so we have to look to the perfect father in heaven who supersedes. Something changed in my life when my dad passed. He was my hero. I had an unhealthy adoration and heroism about my dad in a way that almost my faith was so connected to him being here on earth. I didn't know how I was gonna make it. I remember working for my dad the last year of his life and he gave me one key for my office. And I said, dad, the janitors have more keys than me. I'm your son, give me more keys. One key, Paul, it's all you need. But dad, the security guards have more keys than me. I'm your blood. No, one key. And then when he passed, I found myself locked out of doors and asked to preach and feeling unqualified. And, Nights where I wanted to get in the worship center and I couldn't get in because I didn't have the keys to get in. And so I had to call security guards and janitors and they said, why didn't your dad give you more keys? I don't know. Why didn't you, dad? And you might think it's funny, but there were little wounds that I carried at times with my dad. And after a year after he had passed, I remember one night I was locked out of the worship center and I wanted to get in on a Thursday night. We didn't have church that night. The doors were all locked. It was 9.30 p.m. I just wanted to come in here and worship and cry and sit at the piano and talk to God. And I couldn't get in. And I called the janitors. Could you let me in? They said, hey, it's going to be an hour. We're locking up all the doors in the building. And we got to finish up at the BBC building. And then we'll come back. And so I was just sitting out there. I tried to break through the door. I tried to bust through the door. And then I tried to shimmy my credit card between the crack and use, you know, whatever ways. You know, some of you guys have done this before. And uh, I couldn't get in. And I felt this, like, double meaning of the situation. That without my dad here, how am I supposed to be the dad that, that God's called me to be? I need someone in my life to show me. I don't have someone to show me. And maybe there's someone in this room who, who says, Paul, I kind of feel like that because I didn't grow up with a dad. I didn't grow up with a good dad. So I look at doors thinking I can't get in there because I didn't grow up in the kind of family that has the keys to get in that door. I don't know how to get through that door. I don't know how to be the dad because I never had someone show me how to be that kind of dad. I, I don't know how to talk to my kids because I didn't have a dad that talked to me. I didn't have a dad that hugged me. I didn't have someone that said I love you. And so I'm locked out of doors and and that night, there I was sitting, locked outside of this door, and I couldn't get into my parents' church. <laughs> and finally, I pulled out that one key I had, and I start messing with it, just thinking maybe I can stick it in there. And, and man, it went right in. And I was like, wait, what? I've never tried this before. <laughs> I felt so stupid. And I turned the key, and it unlocked the door. I was like, wait, what? 
angels are messing with my key here. Then I went inside and I put it in the drum closet door and unlocked that door. And then I put it in the choir room door and unlocked that door. And I, finally it dawned on me, I've had the master key this whole stinking time. What? I didn't even know it. And I want to say to every boy in this room, oh, Jesus, you have the master key. You have the master key. You have what it takes to be the man that God's called you to be. You have what it takes. The master key is not having an earthly father that does it all right, having an earthly father that modeled it perfectly for you. The, the master key is not having a, a perfect family that's never experienced wounds or disappointments or rejection. The master key is not a, a certain amount of money that's been given to you in an inheritance. Maybe they left nothing for you. But I wanna tell you that the master key is a relationship with the perfect Father in heaven who loves you, who's for you, who's with you, who's in you, who wants to help you, who wants to strengthen you, who wants to give you grace when you least expect it. And David and his son, they never did have that restoration, but God gave David more children. And David learned to be the dad he was called to be. And next week, we'll finish this series with David passing the baton, the legacy, off to Solomon. And it will be beautiful. But out of this family of David came another relationship between a father and a son. A father and a son who loved each other perfectly and who went into the woods for you and for me and went to a tree and was pierced in his side and pierced in his hands and feet. He died for you to pull you out of the addictions, to pull you out of the generational curses, to give you identity, to tell you you are a son, a mighty son of God, a mighty woman of God. You are his daughter. He died in the woods so that you could get out of the woods. He gave his blood for you and for me so that you could be adopted into the family of God. It is the gospel. I want you to stand your feet all over this room. There is a father in heaven who loves you, who's with you, who's for you, who wants to heal your heart, who wants to set you free from the woods, who wants to heal whatever wounds you're carrying towards dad, whether dad's still alive or whether dad's gone. Maybe you're here today and you say, Paul, I need prayer. I need prayer. I need God's strength. I need to stay on the battlefield. I've been tempted to wander into the woods. All over this room with heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you, just raise your hand all over this room, men and women. Yeah, hands going up everywhere. Lord, help me. Some of you need to forgive your dad today. You need to forgive someone who hurts you. If that's you, just raise your hand today. You're saying, I'm choosing to forgive. It's not gonna be easy. I'm not expecting it to happen in one moment. It'll be a, a, a process. But today you're saying, I wanna start the process of forgiveness. Maybe you're here today and you say, I missed it. I made some bad decisions and I need forgiveness. I need God's mercy. I need a second chance. Maybe it's a third chance, a fourth chance, but today God wants to give you grace. If that's you, raise your hand. Today is your day to say, yeah, I'm ready. I repent. I missed it. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. Someone here today, you find yourself caught in the woods, looking at stuff, doing stuff. There's things you know you shouldn't be doing, and today you can walk out these doors and hide it from man, but you can never hide it from God. This is a moment for God calling out to you come out of the woods come out of the woods it's like there's a rope attached to you and God will never let go of that rope he's trying to pull there's a tug of war going on for your soul Satan's trying to pull you deeper into the woods but God won't let go he's saying come on let me help you get out let me help you get out get back on the right path if you're here today and there's sin or there's darkness or you just say man I need to repent and turn to God I want you to lift your hand up all over this room today let it pull you out of the woods yep hands going up all over this room if you raised your hands for any of those questions would you leave your seat boldly Come and meet me at this altar. Come and join me at this place of forgiveness, of redemption, of mercy, of grace, of identity, of healing the father wound, healing your heart and your mind and your soul. Yeah, cheer them on all over this room. Every person that raised your hand or you say, I need prayer. I need a fresh start. I need strength. I need grace. 
I need healing in my marriage, healing in my family. If you're believing God for healing between you and your son, you and your daughter, you and your dad, I want you to come join me at the altar. I wanna pray for families to be reconciled today. I wanna pray for families to have restoration today. Maybe your son or your daughter's not in church or maybe your dad's not right with God, but today you're saying, I'm gonna come and pray at that altar for my family. I'm gonna go and stand in the gap. I'm gonna be a man that stands in the gap. I'm gonna rise up in Jesus' name. Let's sing this song together. You're a good, good father all over this room. this one day I was having a really hard time and our school is in the church and I was in elementary or middle school and I remember going to my dad's office because his office was in the church connected to the school and when I knocked on the door a businessman opened the door and he was in a meeting with all these guys with suits and ties and I said I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt and I started to walk away and next thing I knew I heard the door open up behind me and my dad touched my shoulder. He said, what can I do for you, Polly? That's what he called me, Polly. I said, Dad, I, I don't need anything. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I don't even have a reason to come today. He, and I said, you're busy. You don't have time. He said, I always have time for my kids. He said, you don't need a reason. I said, well, I guess I'm having a tough day and just wanted to come see you. Man, he just hugged me. He just hugged me. And I just remember standing in that hallway of his office and just hugging dad and maybe you're here today and it's been a while since you've been to your dad's office maybe it's been a while since you just were able to call him father god maybe you're here today and you just need a moment with with god as your father to heal wounds in your heart things that have been happening exhaustion on the battlefield tiredness weariness temptation feeling like throwing in the towel. But today, come down to the Father's office. He wants to meet you. He wants to heal you. He wants to help you. He wants to strengthen you. He's a good, good Father. Right now, I just feel the Holy Spirit is ministering to hearts and minds and people all over this room and watching online. Freedom from bitterness. Freedom from strife freedom from addictions, freedom. Lord, I thank you for strength for the exhausted soldiers on the battlefields. Strength, don't wander off into the woods. God's gonna give you power. You're in a fixed fight. You are more than a conqueror. You have victory through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. Right now, I wanna invite any man in this room 
to come down to this altar because I feel it just it, uh, this morning I just felt a surge to pray for men in this room boys fathers singles whatever uh, age you are if you have the courage just to walk out from your chair if you don't mind doing it if you're close enough to do it if you'd rather stay back there I'll still pray for you but would you just come down to this altar I want any man to come down to this altar today any boy that we're gonna pray and everyone else that doesn't come down, I want you to stretch your hands out for men as they're walking down. We're gonna participate today in covering the men of this house in prayer, in affirmation, in validation, in love, in exhortation, in encouragement to say, you've got this, you are here on purpose, you have a purpose, your best days are not behind you, God's not finished with you yet, you're gonna make it, you're gonna do great things, you got the master key, you got what it takes, men. Men of God, it's time to rise up. Satan has no authority over you, no authority over the marriages, the families, the children that you represent. Today is a new day, a fresh start, new grace, new momentum, new joy. You're gonna go back home with greater joy, a sense of more laughter. You're gonna go back home with a greater sense of purpose, significance. You're gonna respect yourself and respect those around you. God's gonna give you new found significance. Men, I want you to put your arms on each other. Pray for each other right now. Just take a moment. You never know what the man beside you is going through. You never know what he's carrying. The weight of the world might be weighing on his shoulders right now. Jobs and money and kids and family and work and dreams and gifts and callings. And you never know. We're going to pray right now for each other. Down at this altar and across the room, if you're near a man, just pray for him. Lord, I pray for every man in this room to know who they are, to know whose they are. God, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be who you've called them to be, to do what you've called them to do. No weapon formed against these men shall prosper. Any tongue that rises against them shall not stand. Lord, I pray for their hearts to be purified, sanctified, washed by the water of the Word of God, washed by the water of God's love. I pray that they would know how wide, how high, how deep the Father's love is. Lord, I pray they would have a revelation that you are their dad, their papa, their Abba Father. And God, I pray right now for my brothers, for the spiritual fathers in this house, for every man, all the sons in this house. God, I just speak a protection over their heart and mind, a covering of favor. I pray for those that, God, feel the stress and the pressure of financial burdens. God, that you're gonna give them wisdom, grace, creativity, open doors, favor. God, them just coming to church today. God, that you're gonna honor that. God, that you see these men that are working their hardest, trying their best, showing up to church, God, I, I want you to hear the voice of the Father. I just hear God telling me to tell every man in this room, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. You are his son and he is well pleased with you. And he's not finished with you yet. He who started this work will complete it. Let's all pray this prayer together, men and women, boys and girls, everyone. Just say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life for mine paying the price for my sins. I receive your grace, your forgiveness, your salvation. Be my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I'm trusting in you. You are my Father. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God praise today.